Hello. Ken? Good Luke? morning. Luke? Hey. hey. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very funny, man. Very yeah, funny. Little, very little funny. Little very little funny. Little you know, usually the people sitting here are a little bit nervous. The guests. Okay. You know, now it seems to be the other way around. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no I worries. Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean. It's 6 a.m. here. We collected your questions beforehand on social media. And we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You're going to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and... Most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. Ah, a little bit of technical issues, but now we have here, I call him Lucky Luke Inman because he got away from Brexit and now he lives in Mexico. <laughs> you know, he's supposed to be here, but some issues with your passport, bro. What happened? Wait, 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 we have to, with the sound, can you? Does it work, does it work, does it work? Yeah, yep. now? Look, can you guess say what, something? Guess what got issued this morning? Your passport got issued this morning. Yeah. Yay. So, a bit late. I think this is yeah. your way of trying to get a better spot later on the best weekend in the end of the show, but it didn't work. Now you're here. Where, where are you sitting yeah. there? Is this your... Where is your cat, by the way? The cat was too lazy to want to join me and pretend I was a Bond villain. It's <laughs> six in the morning here, and the cat was like, I'm staying in my basket. Okay. Uh, we actually also have uh, Greg here who wants to say hello later. But now we talk a little bit about, what do we actually talk about? Wide-angle videography, right? We can, talk, we can talk about anything. You tell me. <laughs> Great. You send us a few things, um, what you're doing. I think uh, we're going to show some examples of your work. And then we also answer a few questions about wide-angle videography. There's some interesting uh, approach that you, got, that you are doing there. Uh, tell us before, like, what are you doing there uh, in La Paz, in the beautiful La Paz, Mexico? I would say fundamentally we're doing, we're doing three things. We have, we have the dive center where we uh, host wonderful institutions and people like yourself, where, where we're doing everything from teaching open water diving to teaching full instructor trimix. Um, then we're doing with help with logistics and uh, providing camera support for, for example, this year, last year would be Planet Earth 3. Um, this year will be a huge Nat Geo production where we do all the logistics, the dive safety. Um, and then we have um, sort of our creative uh, arm where we're producing everything from a full scale production for TV to these beautiful little shorts that we love doing because we get to direct, edit, shoot, 
Mm. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> this is in complete control of everything. <laughs> yeah, this is this is pretty cool because we've been talking to a lot of guys like Mone Hardenberg and Andy Casagrande, and we always talk about you know you're a passionate filmmaker and you film for the big networks and then once it's done you give all your hard drives to them and you never know what they're going to do with it so in your case it's basically both sides you cameraman for big productions help with the logistics at the same time creative mind doing things out there in the ocean just the way you like it uh, not as much as i'd like it all my way but yes it's it's a privilege it's definitely a privilege being able to do a little bit of everything and certainly getting asked to just, you know, being given a brief and said, give us this. Um, and sometimes that has restrictions, sometimes it has none whatsoever. So, if, if someone comes around and says, you know, you, it's easy for you because you have an amazing camera setup, you can do a lot of things because you're technically well set up and stuff like that, what would you answer to them? Uh, if they were asking me work about that? No, because you know a lot of people think it's about uh, the camera. equipment and the camera you have to oh, make no, it yeah, interesting. No, um, I think there's two wonderful quotes. I think it was Annie Len Lenovitz that, that shoots for Vanity Fair. She said, "If you're worried about the pixels or the number of the camera, you're not a photographer." <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a wonderful book. It's a very very small book, so you'll enjoy reading it. Um, And it's called In the Blink of an Eye. Mm -hmm. And it's written by Walter Merck. <coughs> Walter Merck um, edited um, The Godfather, Godfather 1, Godfather 2, uh, Apocalypse Now. Uh, I think he might have even edited Big Wednesday, a classic surf movie. And he says the three most important things in editing, the first one is emotion. The second one is emotion, and the third one is emotion. <laughs> and you don't need a 46 megapixel camera or a 9K camera to achieve any of those things that Walter Merck or Annie Lenovitz have, have quoted. You know, to tell a story, you just need to tell the story. And that can be with a mobile phone, a GoPro, um, one of these para lenses, uh, anything. Or it could be with an army of crew with a 3D, 4D, I don't know, red camera snap to another one with 70 divers <laughs> pushing it through the water. <laughs> But if your story's no good, nobody's going to watch it. So let's watch a little story that you have been doing, which was the winner of the National Geographic Wild to Inspire 2018. It's one of the videos you send us, if you remember well. What is it about? Yes. So I, I've been collaborating a lot with a, with a, a beautiful couple called Ben and Marvi, um, and it's Ben Lowy and Marvi Lacar. They're Sony artisans, and uh, they wanted to, and we wanted to capture some of the stuff that their two young boys, their two young kids, were saying to them about the environment. And it seems right now that there's a very, very strong push. I believe yesterday a 16-year-old spoke to all the um, leaders of the largest and biggest and most important countries in Davos, in Greta Thunberg. So children, we could have this argument whether children should have a voice, but children very soon are going to have an opinion and be old enough to vote. So we put an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old in the water with sea lions and film their reaction. And everything in that storytelling, we also did it again with great whites. That's to be shown soon when we put them in the cage. Um, and I think, again, that's easy. To capture that story is easy because to capture an eight-year-old's reaction uh, to how a sea lion swims with it. Great, is, let's have a look. It's got to be there. Yeah. It's a story that almost tells itself. <coughs> Okay, great. Let, let's have a look now. Yeah. Okay, Should we play okay. right now and have a look? Mom, 
How big are tiger sharks? Do we kill lemon sharks? Why do people eat sharks? Like how big are Do we kill it for a sport on purpose? Have you swam with them? They ask us all these questions. And we could talk to them about all the problems. Global warming, bleached coral, rising waters, mass extinction, pollution. And it's overwhelming. It makes me feel sad that people kill animals that are in the sea. People that are in the ocean killing every single animal. But when they're in the water, their excitement washes away our despair. And we hope that with every experience we give them, that they are driven to cherish the ocean, to cherish life, and to be part of the solution. Because this generation, these children, they are the embodiment of hope. I wish if I was a sea lion, you know that, Dad? You wish you were a sea lion? Yeah, they're beautiful. I agree. Very nice. This was 2018? 2018. Um, uh, winter of 2017. Nice. And obviously in La Paz, why is La Paz a good place to actually be in your case? Well, you know what La Paz means, what, what La Paz means in Spanish, no? No. It means the peace. The it's very peaceful. Ah. <laughs> There's a lot of marine biologists there. That's what I noticed. That's probably there? why it's so There's peaceful. a lot of marine biologists there. There's a lot of marine biologists. We have marine biologists under every other rock. Um... um <laughs> I think, you know, the Sea of Cortez has always held this beautiful, romantic ideal to me. You know, Cousteau called it the world's aquarium. Uh, you, you know, you and I, we've worked there together. And it has this incredibly distinct seasons. It's one of the only places in the world where you get tropical fish that you can only find in Panama or Nicaragua, or the Caribbean, mixed with huge schools of tuna and mackerel and sardines that you only get in California, Alaska, Oregon, or the Northern Pacific. So it's this sort of incredible melting pot of different types of fish. And then you throw in the fact that it has distinct nudibranchs and invertebrates that nobody talks about, because everyone talks about giant manta rays, schooling hammerheads, uh, whale sharks, sperm whales, blue whales. Uh, when we shot our planet, all the our planet blue whale stuff was shot in the Sea of Cortez. And it has, for me, the most charismatic, beautiful animal in the ocean, and that is the Californian sea lion. Huh. And I, I, I never get bored of saying that um, diving at Los Islotes, diving at, 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 at the sea lion colony in La, colony in La Paz, it's like jumping in the bathtub with Labrador puppies. Um, and uh, La Paz has 400,000 inhabitants. And Los Islotes is an hour and a half. It's an international airport. It's a city, 400,000 people. And in an hour and a half boat ride, you're having an interaction with this beautiful wild animal that you can't have anywhere else. It's incredible. So this is, I would say, an amazing playground. And therefore, we have the first question, you know, how to deal with something like this? You know, you probably can't uh, plan a lot of things. So there's one question that pops up every now and then. What's the best approach in terms, you know, mentally in doing videography when you do not know what you're going to expect for the upcoming dive? You know, for example, you know, shoot or have a story mode, you know, just collect what you get, or what is your approach? My approach, well, one thing I noticed that a lot of, a lot of amateur people don't do and isn't taught in some of the workshops and you see regularly in um, 
and let's be organized. Let's give a good organ. Uh, uh, first, first step: organized battery management. <laughs> oh. oh yeah, great. Nobody mentioned that. Yeah, but yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You know, I I, I see when, when we work with the BBC and Nat Geo, and the first thing the camera department does or the crew do is you set you set up a place to charge your batteries, and then you label them: battery <laughs> one, battery two, battery three, battery four. Then you know if one fails, you know what are charging, what aren't charging. Um, so the first thing is make sure your batteries are charged. And I know that sounds stupid, but I think everyone's experienced the, oh look, it's all going off around me and I'm sitting on the anchor line with a dead <laughs> camera, right? We've all been there, right? Yep. Um, so I think management, you know, ensuring that you're getting in the water with uh, batteries charged and uh, uh, I was going to say cassettes, I was going to show my age then, um, memory <laughs> cards that are empty and formatted and ready to be shot on. But I think uh, they say, uh, you know, luck really is just good preparation. So it's a question of being there. I think for a lot of divers, uh, before you pick up a camera, it, uh, cameras have become so easily available now. We, we carry 4K film cameras in our back pocket. Um, um, and I think Divers need to be much, much better divers in some cases. I think diving needs to be second nature so that you're not doing any damage to the environment. Uh, batteries charged, memory cards ready to take digital information. And I think then the next step is say, okay, right, you know, if you're going to go to the sea lion colony, for example, um, and you want a sea lion portrait, but if you get in the water going, well, I'm just going to film what happens. Um, you might not necessarily get anything, but if you say to yourself, I'm going to go and look for octopus <coughs> and film the octopus changing colors, then that's what you're going to get if you look for it. So I think it's good to have a minimum storyboard of what you'd like to shoot. Like, oh, I want a wide shot of a sea lion and then I want a portrait close up of his whiskers, you know, looking into the camera. Um, uh, things like an establishing shot, the diver falling off the boat. So uh, having a shot list is, is a very, very good start. Um, and then they say, shoot for the editor. So if you're going to shoot the, the diver rolling off the back of the boat, to edit that, you want two to five to three seconds, five seconds either side of that point of action, uh, which, which, you know, Final Cut, Premiere and all the editing software like tail ends of everything. A lot of people don't think like that. Um, so charged batteries, empty cards, slight shot list, good buoyancy and shoot for the editor. How's that for an answer? Yeah, I think it makes total sense. It's interesting because everybody answered this uh, question kind of differently. You know, there's know. the opinion to just go and get what you can get. But I like the preparation aspect, which is, can also be broadened a little bit more into like go at the right time, at the right place, go with the right people, go with the right mindset, you know, all of that. Yeah, perfect. Good, let's uh, head on to another question. We also have a few more clips that you send us, but we just could tag okay. along with what uh, Sonia put in this beautiful presentation here. Lucas is asking, what should a beginner focus on first? Storytelling, technical aspects like aperture, shutter speed, lighting, or editing? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Um, they're kind of all important. <laughs> um, well, I think, um, you know, I, for me, storytelling is the most important, you know. Get in the water and having an idea of the story that you want to tell. But um, if it's not lit properly, I mean, you know, I could, uh, you know, artistically produce my next. I'll just call it night dive, and it will just be a minute of black. <laughs> um, so yes, you, you've got to understand aperture, shutter speed, lighting. Um, but you've got to get in the water. It doesn't matter what type of camera you're getting in the water with, you should get in the water with an objective to tell a story. 
even and the great thing about if, if, if people are using social media to tell their stories as you well know you know Instagram straight away if Instagram's your platform it restricts your your medium to a minute straight away um, and sort of you should work up from there so um, I think that's a great question you should focus on all of them and focus on things being in focus is a good start but um, yeah storytelling I would always start with storytelling what is the the little video that you send us uh, about what is it Instagram world ocean day what is it called here Instagram world ocean day what is this about you know that was a little advert we shot for the dive center and it was just a question of a, that was a good example of <gasps> we're surrounded by dolphins on the boat let's get the drone up <laughs> okay let's have a look at it Is this uh, right in front of your door? Right in front of the dive center. <laughs> Crossing the channel. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Next question is, how I how do I become a pro filmmaker if I'm using basic camera setup like GoPro or compact cameras? Good question. Um, you have to sell your soul. Oh, whoa. <laughs> And invest. Well, there's a number of ways. It depends. Um, you know, people like uh, ABC or uh, Roger Munns, a lot of the people that work for the BBC or do a lot of discovery stuff, you have to now own your own equipment. 20, 25 years ago when I started, I feel old. Um, <laughs> you didn't, you know, the, the, the equipment and the camera will be rented for you. Um, but now you need to kind of be invested with the, with the, a bunch of stuff, uh, camera wise. It's like buying a small car or even a big car for that matter. Uh, but the first thing you should do is the first thing the BBC, Nat Geo, or Discovery Networks, or any producer or anyone looking to employ you is going to want to know is that you know how to shoot a sequence. Um, so that most basic of storytelling. That's the, a good thing. You know, one of the disadvantages of, of underwater is the director's not looking at what you shoot unless you're shooting in a swimming pool, like in a studio environment. So the directors and the producers are going to be like, go and film, uh, for example, you know, go and film schooling hammerheads. Well, to film schooling hammerheads, you need establishing shots, a wide shot, a close up, uh, something that shows that they aggregate, shot something silhouetted. So it's, it's understanding, you know, you, you sort of visualize Attenborough's voice over the top of it and how the BBC would tell that story. And that's the minimum requirement you need to prove that you're capable of doing. Uh, so, not just owning the equipment, being a good diver. You need to prove that you can shoot sequences. You don't need to be able to edit them. You don't need to be able to put music to them, but you need to prove that you can do more than a wide shot. <laughs> that's a good point. We didn't have this one. Nobody mentioned the sequence. That's true. Uh, rule. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Let's have a look. There is a video in here about a uh, little show reel diving in La Paz. Let's see if we Which can. Which one's that? This one. Ah.
the thing that obsesses me is the miracle of life. So the development of love for life, respect for life, is a thing that I would like everybody to share. To share. It's a water planet full of beautiful things that we have no right to suppress for the future generations. We have to preserve it for those who will follow us, follow us, follow us, follow us. Ah, is there some yeah, of the... Yeah, that was for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we heard of these guys. Is it uh, yeah. more, so some of the more commercial things that you're doing? Most recently, yes. I'd say some of the content that we've done Uh, for Paddy recently, uh, we told a lot of the uh, My Paddy videos. Um, that, there's a funny story behind that video. We spent three or four days producing content uh, for Women's Dive Day, the first time Paddy put a budget together to record and promote women in diving. And that compilation video was put together just to show the branding department kind of what we had and the direction that we wanted to go in and hey this is what we've got what would you like us to do with it and they went oh it's great can we use it and we were like well, that's not really kind of what we had in mind and it got used anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it is always the same thing if you give the client you know the wrong chance they take it yes But it's actually not the wrong chance. It's a very nice video. Yeah, it worked out really well. Absolutely. Another question coming okay. up. How do you choose from all of your footage the best couple of minutes for your one video? How do you select your shots? How do you select your shots? Um, you know, very often, uh, one of the ways I do it is... First of all, if we have a storyboard or it's a short story, you, you kind of know because if you've planned it, you should only have two or three or four. <coughs> let's, say you four haven't, let, let, let's say you haven't planned it much because I think okay. most of the people are yeah. like opportunistic filmmakers. They film what they can get. Normally, you know, probably don't have the big logistics around to go back and forth, come back next week when the weather is better and stuff like that. So there is things. I think we can apply that also to the whole post-production uh, process. Where do you start? Do you start with the music? Do you start with the, a montage and go with the music later? Do you, like, how do you do that? I, I, I have to admit, honestly, I've done both. Um, with the ocean, the World Ocean State, um, I just used, uh, I can't remember, it was a stock agency, it was, you know, $16.99, $16, you know, uh, and it's unlimited use because it's actually... Uh, you it talk about the music. music? You talk about music. Pardon? You talk about the music. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, in that case, I started with the music. But I started with the music because the footage was shot at 60 frames per second and it was slowed down and it needed that slightly slower approach. So in that case, I started with the music, but depending, like, with the... Uh, there's that, they say that you open with your second strongest shot and you finish with your strongest shot. Uh, <laughs> um, so I would say sometimes with the short movies, with the short promos, we start with the music. That Paddy video started with the music and then we just kind of looked at what we got and kind of choose and went, okay, let's use this and that works. And, um, But f for the short movies, we start almost invariably always with the music. I agree. For the I, little I, Instagram shorts. Yeah, I always start with the music. I don't know. I even take the music on, on the trip. And just like when sorting out things and just getting like a control over your shots and in every evening, you just play some music and you get like a lot of inspiration by just combining, like loosely combined music and footage and then you already can understand what kind of feel you want to have. So I totally agree. I think... I, I have a question for you. Do you use Spotify? Do I use what? Spotify? No. 
because oh, I really, oh, I really hate finding amazing music that I'm not allowed to use. <laughs> that would that would be good because I, I would say the strongest thing about for me that I associate with your work and behind the mask is the music. Yeah, thanks. I so always much. know I, that I, behind the mask are going to use this incredible music that makes me go, how did they find that? <laughs> well, if we basically start searching five years ago. Okay. And we find things that we're probably not going to use, and we yeah. find things that we were not looking for. I think it's, it's the same with sorting out your footage. If you, ha if you are efficient, and you try to do it efficiently, then you try to only go one place for one time. You're not going to want to, like, sure. like, after the dive, in the evening, when we sit together and go through the footage, you already have to integrate that time that you spent there to look at your footage for the first time, to actually sort out things, and, yes. to, and, you know, and to minimize the footage that you have, because you, you, you know how it is. Where is the one shot that I have seen some time before, and you don't find it anymore, and yeah. it basically messes up all your post-production energy, because you're sitting there like, where, where is the shot, where is the shot, and you don't find it anymore. And with the music, it's the same thing, because we work a lot with Musicbed, we've also been using uh, Audio Jungle and EpidemicSound.com and stuff like that, it just depends on the budget and on the subscription that you have and how serious you really want to do it, but I think Musicbed is very outstanding in a sense that there is uh, artists represented on that platform, where there's lyrics, and that's a, an amazing thing to really <laughs> understand because the music will add a completely different layer. You know how it is. You can, you can have a sure. song, you, you see it without pictures, and it's, I don't know, maybe it's a love song or something else. If you combine it with the pictures, you can utilize the lyrics. You can even download the song in an instrumental version and just sure. cut out the stuff that the lyrics, you know, of the lyrics that you don't like. So you can kind of manufacture your own kind of song for that. And when you do that and you see, you know, you listen, you, I don't know, you want to have something for your video and you go there and say, this one doesn't really work with my project, but it's already amazing. Yes. And you know I'm going to use it later for something else. Just make libraries, organize all of that, but that you don't have to go back and say like, there was that one song, remember? When I was, yeah. you know, super relaxed. Uh, and a completely different mood, and then you might even listen to the same song, but it ha doesn't have the same effect. So you always, we always make like libraries uh, for that to answer uh, that question. But yeah, I also think that starting with the music is a very uh, good way to actually get how long is the video under control. You know how it is. If you don't want to yeah. make 10-minute videos, if you start with your footage, you end up with 10 minutes because you don't really know. You know, don't have to type with the music. You always know what can the music deliver. The music can be like having different parts, can start slow, and then you kind of get a feeling for the whole thing. Like this is going to be roughly around two and a half minutes and the music is lined up and then edit the pictures on the music. I, I don't know, I you know, you can do it completely differently, but this is the way we do it. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a good example of when, when working in a team, some of these three, four minute videos we've produced in the past uh, for clients such as Paddy. I've put together a rough cut on the timeline. And let's say the, 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 the short film couldn't be more than four minutes. And I've left five and a half or six minutes on the timeline, just thrown it down and gone, these are the components I want in it. And then I have a wonderful editor here called Martin, who's local to La Paz. And I disappear and I say to him, here's the script, cut it down. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I mean, you're lucky to do that because you have another guy like doing it and you have two brains working on the same thing. That's pretty cool. But, but what happens then is by stepping away from it, and this, this sometimes works... I know a lot of couples that produce this way. You, you step away from the work. You come back and you see what someone else has done to it. And then they go, there's just this one thing that's not working. And I go, do that. Yeah. And they go, how did you manage to figure that out? And you're like, I've not seen it a thousand times. Exactly. So, yeah. that's why so sometimes yeah. that, that, you know, working with somebody else in post-production can be a benefit. It might create a huge domestic argument and a fight. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I think you can achieve the same uh, effect if you sleep. 
you you could. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, you, if you if you like, you do a video. It's done in one day. You're not going to release yeah. it. You always sleep one night at least. Of course. You know, and then you can look at it from a different, uh, fresh perspective. Yeah, but I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, the post-production tunnel, you get in there and you get like, ah, I don't know if, if this is good what I'm doing. Just take a rest. Go for a walk. Do something else. Just don't play ping pong because you might break your leg. And then uh, everything should be fine. Good. Okay, hey, there's I another... I still remember that not to play ping pong. Huh? I still remember that. Not to play ping pong. No, yeah. I broke my leg playing ping pong in South Africa. You, yeah, you yeah, did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. During summer. the sardine yeah. run. Yeah, yeah. It's basically uh, Greg's fault. Yeah, uh, it's actually Tony's fault because Tony is such a worse ping pong player that I got used oh, really? to just standing there. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Greg comes along and challenges me much more. And then, uh, I, yeah, it, it was my fault in the end, but still. Well, you know, you know I think uh, the human injury follows that Frenchman. So, sorry? Human injury follows that Frenchman around. Yeah. It's Greg's fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't make jokes about it. But yeah, I have the feeling. Um, Ocean Revelations, is it called? Oceanic Revelation? The video that you oh, sent? Yeah, that, wow, that's an old project. You want to show that or you want to hide it? <laughs> I don't mind if you want to show it. I thought it was too long to show on this. But I haven't, was, I haven't seen it. Board. Yeah. I haven't seen it. And, and that's a really good example of, of, of that. Amanda Cotton shot all of that and just didn't know what to do with it and dumped it on me, not dumped it. I mean, literally went, what would you do with this? And I went, would you let me do whatever I want with it? And she was like, okay. And the result was what we got. And she's a photographer. And she's a photographer. She's not a filmmaker, not a cameraman. And it was her first attempt at sort of shooting video and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Uh, That's interesting. Let's see it from that perspective. What happens and if it, a... And it, it, it came from her knowing what she wanted, but not really quite knowing where to start. Well, to know what you want is always a good step. Yeah. I most of the time don't really know what I want until I see it. But good. Let's have a look at it. Um, shot by Amanda Cotton, professional photographer and edited by uh, Luke Inman. Interesting combination. What struck me is that something that is so feared by so many people that when you get in the water with them, they're not out to just bite you. They, they actually let us swim with them. I think sharks are misunderstood in general just based on the fact that people uh, have not experienced them. It's just all fol folklore. It's, they read about shark attacks and they have this idea of what it's like, but they don't know what it's like because they've never been there. Um, certainly the oceanics are, you know, can be an aggressive shark, but from what I've seen, I felt very comfortable diving with them throughout the week. I think sharks in general are misunderstood probably because people don't ever spend the time in the water, they're afraid. They see them circling their boats and they're afraid that they're going to eat them rather than maybe they're just curious. After spending a week with them, I would say they're one of the most forgiving sharks. Actually very easy to dive with. You just have to be aware of them at all times, especially when there's a lot of them. But certainly, if you respect them, they're going to respect you and there's really nothing to really worry about. They're definitely something to be cautious about and be careful not to get uh, complacent or put your guard down, but I, I also think that they're very gentle at times and they're not, and, and just curious, they're not something that's like, oh, there's a person there, I'm going to go eat you. They're like, let me check you out, let me see what you're about. And each one has a personality. 
I, I think that was the thing. When I when I went into this, I was just thinking, oh, they're clone copies, they're machines, they look identical. And then when you get in the water, you're like, oh, there's that one's really curious, gentle, that one's a little bit more shy. That was one of the things that just blew me away. It's like each one has a personality. And I think that uh, going into it, if you never had a pet or a dog, not that they are, but you, you, you never would think that they have a personality until you're in the water. Uh, probably one of the best shark diving experiences I've ever had. Um, a very interactive shark, a very fun shark actually to photograph, so thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, uh, certainly uh, we'll look forward to doing this again, and hopefully at some point if I have that opportunity. It was like a dream being out there and definitely great respect and admiration for them. Hopefully I can share it with my friends and, uh, and persuade them to come out here and spend some, some time with them. They're just gorgeous animals. I don't think any land predator would let you do that. Um, it was just amazing that they actually invited us into their world and let us join them. And I think if people really knew more about them and could have those interactions like that, I think a lot of that fear would be replaced by a love and a desire to protect them. Shot by the wonderful oh. Amanda Cotton and edited yeah. by Luke Inman. I think the white, the oceanic white tip is a very interesting shark to actually dive with. Is that Cat Island? That is Cat Island. Um, uh, for me, my motivation on that was one of the best scenes in cinema is that scene in Jaws where Kint is talking about the sinking of the Indianapolis and the oceanic white tips taking all the 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 seamen and eating them and, uh, you know, all the sailors and Navy men. And, and uh, it's one of those sharks that's very much maligned. And I can't remember, that did actually win, I think it was the Miami International Film Festival, uh, like best conservation video. And, oh, maybe even 10 years ago now. I, can't, that's, I didn't even know that was still up on my website. <laughs> 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 okay. All right, Luke, it was nice having you here. We actually already burned through the time. I think this one is for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I hope you get your passport thing sorted out <laughs> now, free to travel, free to go wherever you want. You're and a free man now. <laughs> yeah. Great having you here. Thanks when a lot. are you guys coming to visit? Uh, we have to talk to Greg, right? But uh, yeah, send our regards to Afelandra and everybody else. And uh, we're going to come over for sure to bug you. Do you recognize yeah, him? Yeah, he's the French guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Good. If you stay online, we can uh, have a chat a little bit longer later. Um, OK. Great. Thanks a lot. Next You're coming welcome. up. Thank you. Huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, without you, there would be not much to talk about. But thanks a lot. Great. OK, next coming up is Evan Sherman at 3.30, Creative Macro Video Lighting. That's going to be an interesting one. Um, 3.30, and we take a short break and see you in half an hour. Bye, guys.
Hey Luke, how are you? Uh, I can, uh, I'm done. I can hear. I call you, Luke. Okay. Okay, I call you. I can hear you, so I will give you a call. What is it? I will call you. Ah, okay. He's giving you a call. Okay. Thanks, man. Oh, Thank sorry to wake you up much. so early. I enjoyed it. Great.